Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Three Things Your Infrastructure Must Have in 2021. This event is brought to you in partnership with Pure Storage and produced by Actual Tech Media. Thanks so much for joining us on the webinar. This is going to be a really fun discussion with experts from Pure Storage. Of course, we want this to be an educational event and we encourage your questions. We'll be standing by to answer those electronically during the presentation today. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'll be serving as your moderator for the webinar. You'll find the questions panel there in your audience console right next to the word handouts. I'll be talking about our best questions prize here in just a moment to encourage your questions. But first, don't forget to check out the handouts tab as well. There are some resources there that you can download for additional information on today's topic. And then finally, we'll be announcing the winner of the Amazon $300 gift card door prize at the end of the webinar. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. New for 2021, we're doing our best question prize as well for an additional $50 Amazon gift card. Prize winners will be selected and contacted after the event. You must still meet the Actual Tech Media prize policy. And now I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenters. It's great to have back on Mr. Andrew Miller, Principal Systems Engineer at Pure Storage. Eugene McGrath, Field Solutions Architect at Pure Storage, and Mr. Brian Farrar, Senior Solutions Marketing Manager, also at Pure Storage. It's going to be a fun discussion. So with that, I'll hand it off to you, Andrew. Take it away. Thanks so much. It's always, it's always a pleasure to be on an actual tech webinar, especially having known uh, James and David and Scott Lowe for, for, for so many years. And one of, one, David and I actually we live in the same state, which is cool. You know, that, that's relatively rare. My name is Andrew Miller. Really appreciate you joining us here today to talk about Flashstack, a follow up from Cisco Live. As you can see on the screen, I'm joined by a couple other amazing presenters. Uh, I'll do my intro first and say, hey, I'm first there in alphabetical order. Andrew Miller, principal technology strategist with Pure. I've been exploring this space for a while, started as a customer, then to a partner, spent a lot of time with CI and HCI and other stuff. I will kick it off today for about 15 minutes, walking through some general. Um, data center life cycle and to the cloud, you know, hybrid cloud pieces. I love that I'm going to be followed by Eugene McGrath uh, walking through some InterSight pieces. Do you mind introducing yourself, Eugene? Absolutely. So my name is Eugene McGrath. I've been with Pure about five years. Previous to Pure, I have a similar background to Andrew. Uh, you know, I came from the VAR space. I was in the post sales deployment, uh, management, configuration. So everything I care about is how do we manage it, right? So uh, a, a pleasure to be here today. And over to you, Andrew. Uh, and actually, then uh, we'll be bringing it home. We'll be talking about as a servicey things. And uh, Brian Farrar, he's got well, you and I have swapped a lot of cool stories in the time we worked together, Brian. But uh, if you don't mind introducing yourself, so Brian Farrar here. I'm the marketing manager for FlashStack at Pure Storage, and um, I'm in a unique position to be on the storage side because I joined from Cisco, where I was on the converged infrastructure side uh, with compute. So I have some visibility into the entire stack we're going to be talking about today. I've been with Pure for about three years, and um, much of my background, however, is on the application side. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about um, Pure as a service and flexible consumption, one of the uh, great use cases for it is accelerating your application workloads. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Andrew. Thank you. That's one of the things I've enjoyed, Brian. I mean, we, we talk hardware stuff like uh, i don't know optane and and very quickly you're like let's pull that into the application layers just how your brain's wired so you know it's great okay diving in uh, like i promised uh, we will keep this moving relatively fast i'm getting to kick it off by exploring the theme of on-prem cloud yes because we potentially want both of those what i find interesting here is that as pure the way that we try and approach this topic and even flash stack in general is not by starting with, hey, you know, what's on the truck? What are the products? That kind of thing. The way that I like to start this conversation is by thinking about what your life is like, what my life used to be like as a customer. You know, I'm thinking about day zero. I'm thinking about architecture. I'm thinking about how do I deploy and implement? And then how do I go and operate, operate and optimize business as usual, whatever terms you like there. As I'm going through that thought process, there's challenges throughout each of those phases of ownership. You know, we, we need value out of it 365 days a year, like the title says. But there's things around, you know, in day zero, we're forecasting out, you know, is this going to be flexible enough architecturally to take me out to five years and to scale and even link into the cloud? 
as as in day one, you know, how long is it going to take me to deploy that? And even verging into the management pieces, can we hit SLAs? If we upgrade, is it going to be disruptive or not? Now, when we talk about it, and I didn't even think about this with the just talking about application pieces with you, Brian, application stacks are built out of infrastructure. Purpose of infrastructure is applications. So we need a stack that can be fast and flexible in meeting SLAs. It can run workloads quickly. That feels a little bit cloudy, right? In hours, maybe even less. And doesn't require forklift upgrades, not a almost an innovation tax, if you will. I want to embrace the new technology. Eh, I got to roll out the old stuff. I got to bring in the new stuff. I got to migrate all my data. Like we know this is what we have to do often, but it's not like we love it. And it's not like the business cares about it. So we look at the landscape that's been out there historically, almost a little bit of data center history. I love there's a whiteboard in the background because sometimes I'll actually whiteboard this out, you know, kind of the history of the data center going from, you know, reference architectures to converged infrastructures that you're more defined to HCI. That's where some of the hyperscaler concepts and software come and stomp around in our data center. You know, all of these have various trade-offs. Sometimes I'll do a longer walkthrough on this, but for the purpose of today, I, I think it's easy to say all of these are driving toward the goals of simplicity, rapid deployment, you know, not having to pay, you know, innovation tax, the previous slide. What we believe is that Flash Stack helps give you the best of each. And, and in some cases, we even partner in various ways around these ones. And sometimes I'll even say that, you know, Flash Stack is a little bit of a reference architecture plus simplifying and stabilizing the core infrastructure to get the benefits of what we see from CI and HCI. So core definition, hopefully you know this, you know, Flash Stack is a partnership between Cisco and Pure. You probably figured that out from the title slide or you're attending this webinar. So we look at Cisco UCS, core innovation 10 years ago or so was to make the server platform stateless. You know, we do things with the fabric interconnects, uh, with uh, fabric interconnects with the blades, with the chassis, uh, abstracting the identity of a server into a service profile. You pair that up with storage that is stateless and you get some really interesting kind of force multiplier impact. Of course, we need solid networking. I'm not leaving that behind, but it's almost like sometimes I know we know that Cisco has that part covered, right? So that statelessness force multiplier combined on the server and the computes and the storage standpoint leads you into this kind of thing where the tagline is architect once innovate continuously. But while this is a slide that actually has, you know, it actually has a bunch of uh, uh, different models on it and you'd be like, whew, that's, that's a lot to look at. The point that I like to draw out is we have customers as pure and started with us back in the FA320 days, the very beginning of pure. They've been able to upgrade controllers and the underlying storage modules going from SSDs to we buy a NAND and put them in our own modules without taking downtime or performance impact, you know, swapping controllers, evacuating previous smaller NAND modules, et cetera, going to newer ones. Similarly, we have, there are customers today, we have customers, you know, where they started with the original Cisco chassis. It's kind of shown there a little bit, the 5108 chassis. They're still using that same chassis. They've been able to incrementally upgrade the fabric interconnects, the backend fixes, those are the interconnectivity models, the different individual servers. They've been able to architect once and not have to pay the technology tax as they've leaned into new capabilities. That's why when sometimes I'm, I'm talking with folks, especially if you have a technical background, the reason we kind of drive this home a little bit is that statelessness, that shared statelessness across compute storage and networking is the foundation of what makes FlashStack impactful to you as a customer. It's also the foundation of what makes FlashStack different because I'm not going to pretend that we as Pure and as Cisco, we don't work with other companies, but there's a uniqueness to that core technical stateless foundation that plays out in some really cool ways. Because I, I mean, I used to get paid time and a half to do data center upgrades overnight to do data migrations and other stuff, even going all the way back to Novell. Yeah, maybe I'm not that old, but you know, still right kind of thing. And as well, the day zero and one and two is not just front end messaging. We actually take that and we'll come back to that value, the, the capabilities of Flash Stack through that lens. You know, so we talked about our architect once and innovate continuously. You know, the idea that if you can grow easily, you can buy only what you need when you need it. You know, you've built into a platform that is that there's a fast, predictable deployment thanks to Cisco validated designs. We can add disaggregated flexibility where we can actually add capacity, we can add compute and storage independently. There's some pieces here that I'm not where I'm not going to steal Eugene's thunder around Cisco Intersight and management, and even some future looking pieces about being able to get, even in the operational context, being able to bring in new performance capabilities without being disruptive from an operational standpoint. Okay, last but not least, 
I want to go through a little bit of a, oh, actually, not. There, there's two more major themes. Shame on me. So uh, I want to go through a little bit of a grab bag here of when you go and look at Flash Deck, there is some messaging, and really appreciate actually working with Eugene and Brian on this over the last year, where we've taken and looked at the platform at a high level. Now, anytime that you do that for high level value statements, it can sometimes get a little bit mushy, right? You know, you simplify it up and it, that can happen. But what I want to emphasize is here, when we look at Flash Deck, we think about it in terms of simplicity, flexibility, and speed. And each one of these has real meaning and depth to it. So to go there briefly, from a simplicity standpoint, you know, that you can actually say, you know, this is simple enough. The underlying pieces are simple enough as pure and as UCS. I'm not going to pretend there's not some, some stand-up effort there needed. And this is where uh, our awesome channel partners are, are integral to this. But, you know, that simplicity can lead to, and we've seen it, lead to reducing the staff time needed to manage infrastructure, reducing operational resource requirements by 61%. You know, th there's an IDC study for that. It's a, it's a small footnote, but, you know, there, there's something behind it. We even think about simplicity from a management interface standpoint, the simplicity of Pure, pulling things into a single interface with Intersight, and even what Pure One does. So we're not even, we're reducing the number of interfaces or dramatically simplifying them enough that you don't, if you're not in them every day, it's not crazy to try and figure out. There's simplification around manual provisioning. And even you can make a case that Pure and Cisco, in this case, it's really, it's a software platform with only the hardware that's needed to enablement. From a flexibility standpoint, you know, we're going to kind of take this concept we talked about before and uh, flip it through a different lens. Architecting once and not having to rip and replace and not having to take downtime or performance impact for upgrades. I know I said not like five times, but if you take those things out of your day-to-day -day operations, how much time does that give you back to be flexible? That's why we put this under flexibility, flexible to the business in a way that's impactful to the business. So it's not that we are spending so much time keeping the lights on and doing the things that frankly the business and our competitors don't really care about, right? Kind of thing. You know, your competitors, they're not, they not, oh, they've got pristine infrastructure. I mean, they're competing with you. Speed. What's interesting here is speed is not just about, say, especially as pure sometimes, pure, working for pure storage, like being upfront about that. Sometimes people think about pure, well, speed is about flash and it's about latency and all this stuff. It is. But it's also about speed and how quickly you can respond. Now, so you may be thinking like, huh, that sounds a little bit like flexibility. You're right. There, there's some overlap there, but in good ways. So if someone comes to me and says, how quickly can you spin up for a new application? If you know that it, you actually have re reduced need for silos and the underlying infrastructure, if you put disparate applications on, will automatically bog down, that dramatically impacts your ability to spin up new capabilities quickly. So you, and even that you can reprovision things. That goes back to the statelessness, you know, repurposing from one use case to another as your business changes. Now, to bring it home, or at least for my first section, bring it home. You may remember the first slide said on cloud, on prem, cloud. Yes, the answer is yes. So the other piece that I like to talk about here is that for a lot of customers, for a lot of you, for, for us, we know there are huge trends around public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, right? But the question of how quickly are things moving is hard. It's hard for all of us. It's hard for us as an industry. It's hard as individual customers. So I like to talk about, you know, as we think about Flash Stack being the best on-prem foundation for a hybrid cloud strategy. Now, why do I say that? So we think about what a hybrid cloud looks like. You know, there's got to be security, simplification, standardization. There's got to be orchestration, an API-first platform. I left that out earlier, but that's there. And a high amount of flexibility. If you're spending, say your CIO, your IT director has an initiative to move the right things to the cloud. If you're spending all your time with on-prem firefighting and just trying to keep up, you don't have the time to even think about that, to do an application rationalization exercise, look at what things should be refactored, what things should be possibly lifted and shifted, and what trade-offs there may be when you do that. So this is where I think of Flash Stack as being an accelerator to a hybrid cloud strategy by virtue of diminishing the amount of day-to-day -day firefighting, care and feeding, keeping the lights on, whatever term you want. You know, this is via very high availability, six nines, high performance, strong economics from a cost standpoint, Allowing major workload consolidation, not as many silos to keep track of. Security's got to be there almost as a, as a baseline or a given. And the simplicity around, you know, uh, around update process. 
as pure, even to make this a little bit specific, both pure and Cisco, we have various pieces that have wholly leaned into the public cloud. So this isn't just a, please do this. And we hope that you never go to public cloud because we don't want you to check that box. You know, it's, we actually hope you do this. And to even show that, illustrate that from a pure standpoint, we can illustrate it from a Cisco standpoint, but I'm going to pick a pure example. I'll sometimes have a conversation about cloud block store. That's actually the ability to take pure capabilities, pure flash array, and run that as a software virtual storage array, not a virtual appliance, but actually a true virtual array that's software defined, gives you all the same data reduction capabilities that aren't off, often are not with cloud storage. There's mobility for replication in and out potentially in a way that helps with egress costs, same UI, same API, same resiliency. And, and the message here is that we, we partner with multiple cloud providers, and we're not here to say bad things about the cloud, just like we don't say bad things about our NAN providers. You know, th what they create gives us an opportunity. And even though in many cases the cloud providers are bigger than we are, we have like 10 years of hardened code. So we can bring that in the way in the environment thought process of making cloud storage better. Some things that just don't exist there. You ask, you know, on cloud block storage, um, how do you do thin provisioning or do duplication or compression? The answer is you don't. It's just not designed for it. It's not bad. It's just different, right? Or, you know, being able to spin up uh, snapshots and clones. We have one customer that's actually doing this for dev environments, and their workflows would not work without being able to do instant pointer-based snapshots, et cetera. So that is a little bit of an introduction to flash stack some of what's newer hopefully you saw some pieces that were new there as well as maybe a couple old favorites you know like mm, I'm, I'm glad they've kept that in there and not moved away from it however with that i actually want to turn it over to eugene i'm going to stop sharing here we're doing this a little bit live so when i stop sharing uh you'll get to see my our faces oh and eugene that was a perfect transition what do you know so <laughs> with that over to you Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much, Andrew. That was great. Uh, that was, your slides were great. Your presentation is fantastic as always. So thank you very much. Um, and, you, and there's one thing that you, you talked about consistently throughout the, the presentation that's so important. You talked about cloud and, um, and how we shouldn't be adverse to the cloud, right? And one of the things about the cloud that, that is always a challenge is when we talk about management, right? Because we now have this hybrid cloud approach and we have customers that are looking, looking to put their data everywhere. And so when we think about management platforms and how customers manage their environment, it's, it needs to completely change. You know, the, the days of having a tool on site that we had to constantly update and, and, and uh, change and make sure that patches were applied and so forth, those, those days are really, really cumbersome, especially when we talk about infrastructure that's growing geographically, right? That's spread out across many, many different areas. And so we, we really need to look at how does the management stack need to change? And so the first thing is this transition to SaaS. What if our management platform was SaaS based, where I just log into a, a website that is automatically updated, right? So I don't have to worry about applying patches and security patches and, and all these different things. And also, if I if it's if it's in the cloud, it gives me a, a bigger purview of my data. It can now look at every site I have, not just one, not just on prem, not just in the cloud. It can show me everything, and and so those are the things that are really really important to look at. And so when we when we talk about managing Flash Stack, the most important thing is how do we uh, address management in the future? Because everything about Flash Stack is not just management today, but management going forward. And what do we need to manage uh, that stack in the future? And what features are, are important to us? And so we'll get more into this. I don't want to talk too much to the slide because we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But I do want to introduce Cisco Intersight. And I'm very, very excited because there's a number of capabilities that this helps bring your infrastructure into the, the next generation when it comes to management. And it's, it really comes down to four key areas. The first one being monitoring. So what do we need to monitor our workloads in the future? The first thing is we need a cloud-like experience, right? We need a portal that we don't have to manage. We don't have to upgrade. We don't have to patch. We need it to be seamless. We need it to be easy to use, easy to consume, and requires very little maintenance. The second thing is if I have that management capability, what are, what are all, the, all the other things that I could reduce, right? Maybe I don't need all these tools if I have one, one vision, right? One platform to, to manage them all, and right? Give me that single view. Then now it shows you a single view of all, all your data. So being able to monitor everything from one place. The second piece is now if it's SaaS based and it's in the cloud, what does that do to the deployment aspects of everything that we do? What it means is that now I have access to multiple sites. I can access the data regardless of where it is. If it's in the cloud, if it's you know if it's on prem, if it's in a DR site, I now have the ability to to see all those sites. And what that means is that I can actually build those orchestration pieces to be site agnostic. In that when I run that workflow, now it just says what site do I want to deploy this on. So imagine how much simpler that makes your orchestration when it comes to building out entire uh, server deployments and so forth. 
And then the third piece is it simplifies firmware downloads and updates, right? If I have a catalog that I can put in the cloud, I can then select this is the firmware I want, apply that right from, from the, the web interface, and I can apply that across multiple sites. It makes, it makes that, uh, that process so much easier. And it makes it uh, a lot a lot simplified compared to uh, what we've seen in the past, where I had to log into all these different vCenters. I had to log in here. I had to log in there. I had to remember the ILO or the DRAC addresses, right, and and log into those servers individually. This means now I can deploy all that firmware and and drivers from one place. But it actually gets even better than that because how do I know if I even need to apply that firmware? Well. The, the third piece that's really, really important to management is around compliance. And so one of the things that Intersight does is it, it maintains this hardware compatibility tool that tells me what firmware I need to run on these different servers. So now, not only can I update it from this one interface, but now I know when I need to update it. And on top of that, I'll see all these things like advisories and alerts to, to know if there's other things I should really be paying attention to. So it really takes all that guesswork and all the complexity out of, of trying to manage your infrastructure on a day-to-day -day basis and makes it a lot easier to manage because it's now automated. And it's right, everything is about automation. Everything, and that's the most important piece. But the fourth piece, which is which I think is the most important, is how we address things like support. Because let's face it, it hardware does break uh, on occasion. It's just inevitable. But what we've seen in the past is this kind of reactive support model where, okay, now I got to call, I got to sit on the phone, and, and it hasn't necessarily been a problem with Cisco per se. Um, this is just in the industry, but it's always cumbersome to sit on the phone for three hours just to get someone on the, on the, the phone who's going to go through a list of questions that they should already probably know, right? And so what, what we have here is this idea of connected tech. And so what connected tech does is it, it, it basically collects those logs and it sends it up. So you don't never have to open that. But I want to save that for a little bit later on in, in the deck because we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's talk about proactive guidance. So getting out of this mode of reactive and, and being considerably more proactive with things like firmware updates. So knowing that we have a new version available, we should really consider upgrading to that, to that version. Um, it really automating this entire process, also keeping your, your infrastructure in compliance, right? You have certain regulations, your, your security teams, they want to make sure you're always on the right security patches, right? And so knowing that you, you are in the right patches is always important. And then receiving all of your alerts globally. So what if you could receive all the alerts for not just the compute hardware, but also your storage and all these other things, right? So having a central place to see all those alerts. And then creating a baseline and, and being notified if you stray from that baseline. So you create a configuration on the service profile. You want all the firmware to be at this level. If, if something drifts, you know, you have that uh, uh, maybe a developer goes in there and says, oh, I want to install, you know, a different firmware on here. You can see that now and, and get notified that it's not uh, it's not adhering to the compliance baselines that you've set up. And then the, the other piece is around support. If we think about the way it, it's historically been, you had to call, you had to wait on hold and all these things that had to take place before you could even get uh, someone on the phone to deal with. And so the new process is dramatically simpler. It's basically that Intersight will take, collect all the data from all the components attached to it. It sends that data up to the, the cloud where it's analyzed. And if any problems detected, it then we, uh, automatically a case is open for you so that attack agent is already exploring, reading the logs, right? And that, that's the part that I always hated, finding those logs, uploading them. So they're already reading those logs and they reach out to you. So it's very, very proactive. So now you don't have to worry about downtime um, as much and being reactive when, when something happens. Nine out of 10 times, you, you will know that something's going on before even you do or your users do, right? Because we can see that data and, and we can crunch those numbers. And, um, and so when we look at proactive support experiences, it's significantly better than, uh, than, than the reactive model. And then the other piece is we make the configuration a lot simpler. If you if you know anything about service profiles, and hopefully you do, right? Moving those service profiles into the, the Intersight SaaS app means that now I can take that, I can clone it to a different site so that all my sites and all my servers across multiple sites now have the same profile. I can, I can guarantee that the configuration is the same, right? Using those compliance tools and understanding and, and making sure that we have an, a standard across the entire organization. That's one of the things that's really, really key. And then the other piece about about Intersight is is the the programmability or the plugins. And so we fully, you know, pure fully plugs into Intersight. So you can see all the storage components. You can write um, workflows and 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 different orchestration pieces for uh, any pure storage um, solution in in Intersight. And you have the ability to also address other third parties as well. And that's one of the things that's very very important to uh, to the the Intersight 
um, technology. And the other piece here, I always like to put a note coming from post sales is that you do need advantage of premier licensing uh, from Cisco to in order to do this. Uh, but there's there's immense value from this being able to manage more than just Cisco within this within Intersight. And then the other pieces we've talked up up until now we've talked only about hardware, but what about you know, workloads and the actual applications. And this is what's really, really important. So with uh, Intersight Workload Optimizer, you now have the ability to see down to the virtual machine layer. And when you pair that with AppDynamics, AppDynamics can actually tell you about how that database is doing. How's that application running? And all the things that are important to know about that application. How is it connected to another server? And, and how's the performance of this solution as a whole? So being able to see down to the virtual machine level and it also giving you real um, expectations around uh, around suggestions that make your, your workloads better. So maybe uh, it proactively tells you you need to move this VM from here to there because you'll see better performance. These are the things that are really important when we talk about managing your infrastructure going forward. So hopefully what I've demonstrated here with, with Intersight is that it's not about managing your environment today. It's about managing your environment going forward and taking a number of different areas that have been historically very complex and simplifying them. And so what I want to do really, really quickly is just kind of run you through what it looks like. So that's a little Easter egg you get today. I'm going to actually show you what um, Intersight looks like, and I'm not going to go through the entire interface, but what I want to do is show you uh, some of the key features. So Andrew, let me just get a thumbs up from you. Can everyone see my screen? Looks amazing. Right. Awesome. So there are a few things that I'm going to point out here that are that I think are really, really cool coming from the that post sales mind frame um, mindset. And the first thing is this new features have recently been added. I see this about every two weeks. And what that means is that we're constantly adding new functionality, new capabilities within Intersight. So if I click here, now you can see that we just recently added Kubernetes service, IKS, right? As well as um, the HashiCorp. You saw that in the news about HashiCorp. You're already seeing um, some of these, these features being introduced into Intersight, as well as uh, other operating system support. So I'm constantly, you're constantly seeing new capabilities from within, within Intersight. And the other great thing about Intersight is, you know, there's always been this debate about is should it be converged? Should it be hyper-converged? The answer is, why can't I have both if it meets different business needs, right? And so Intersight allows you to see all of your converged as well as your, your hyper-converged with, with Hyperflex. Um, and I think that's a really, really important uh, element here. So I love seeing what's new because I, I, I always look here and say, oh, maybe there's a new capability I want to take advantage of. And that's very, very important. The second thing is I have a dashboard that just gives me a great uh, overview of what's in my environment. How is everything doing, right? For, for example, I have two critical items here. Uh, on the server health that I need to take a look at. If I click on it, I can see, oh, well, you know, this something's wrong here. It looks like there is a, a, a virtual interface that's down and I need to address that, take a look at that. The, the second thing that I can see here is that, oh, well, my contract is, is running out. So maybe I need to look at uh, updating my service contract. And so knowing that you're always being supported and that, uh, and, and that you have support is, is important. And so from here, I could actually just generate a new quote to get uh, additional support on these servers. So the other piece here with the dashboard is being I can uh, being able to customize this. And what I've done is I've customized this so that I can see my storage information uh, overview um, all in one place, as well as uh, any workload optimizations that need to take place. We talked about being able to see down to the VM level. From here, I can I can see uh, any VMs that need to be addressed. So if I click here and, and click optimize. I can see that there's a number of, of different issues that need to be addressed. 20% have critical actions. So I can click here and see what those actions are and then and then go ahead and, and either write a policy or, or take action on this particular issue. So it, it allows us to really fine tune our environment to make sure that it's running in an optimal fashion every single time. So it's not just about the hardware, it's also about the virtual machines, it's also about your applications. So having alerting in, in all these different levels is, is very, very important when we talk about holistic view of your data, right? Um, and the last two things that I, that I wanna talk about is the orchestration piece. One of the things I do love about Intersight, and I've never received any formal training on Intersight, I just uh, dove in and, and started building things, is that it's a visual workflow engine, which means I can go in here and I can then go ahead and alter these, these workflows and just drag and drop different tasks here and, and alter them based on my, my organizational needs. And again, I can write one workflow that applies to multiple sites. And when I go through the, the to run this workflow, I just select the site and, and apply it to where it needs to, to, to be applied. 
And it includes tasks, uh, including not just compute, but also all your storage. Deploy new VMFS data store. That'll go into the Pure, the de de deploy the volume on Pure, and then you know build the data store for VMware. So it's not restricted to just the hardware, the Cisco hardware. It also includes all the Pure components, which you can see in the storage tab here. I can see what my percentage full is. I can go in and also see if there's anything that needs to be addressed, any um, any areas that are, that are of concern. I can see if it's filling up, see things like data reduction rate, and, and everything that's important to you. So it's it's really important that I can see uh, everything that is my storage. And then lastly, just the other thing we we talked about was uh, moving those profiles up into. Uh, up into Intersight, which means that now I can take this profile and clone it, apply it to a different site, and then we can guarantee that that site now has the exact same um, configuration as your previous sites. So that's really, really important when we talk about compliance. And so hopefully this was a great overview of Intersight. There's so much more like Kubernetes and the stuff you can do with Hyperflex, but I, I want to be respectful of our time. And so uh, with that, I will go ahead and say thank you. And if you have any additional questions, never hesitate to reach out. And I will go ahead and turn it to over to you, Brian. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Eugene. Thank, thank you, Eugene. I, I appreciate that. Um, let me just get our presentation right. view up here. So you didn't, you didn't mean to tell a joke. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're hearing me okay, I hope, hopefully. Um, yep. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew and Eugene. You know, first of all, Andrew talked a little bit about why flash stack is unique. You know, what, what, what in the technology makes it so flexible? What makes it so adaptable to your needs? How, how does that discrete architecture work? And then Eugene talked about the importance of a modern management environment, a holistic environment with complete transparency and automation over your entire stack, your compute, your network, and your storage, plus visibility and management of your use cases, your applications. I'm gonna switch gears though here a little bit and talk about perhaps the area with the least advancement in the last 20 years, and that is flexible consumption. Um, uh, both the uh, Cisco and Pure CEOs have made a commitment to move their entire portfolios over to flexible consumption, also known as utility compute models. I won't read the quotes here, but there is commitment as a major strategic motion to serve our clients. Now, <clears throat> traditionally, people have uh, consumed their IT investment as a capital expense, and then flexible leasing started to emerge. Uh, but now we're in a new chipping point where over three quarters of enterprises are saying, hey, we're now recognizing the benefits of a true utility compute model. And that's what we want going forward. IDC predicts that just this year, 2021, there's going to be a three times demand increase for flexible consumption. So almost everybody in our listening zone out there at some point is probably gonna start looking at a new way to consume your IT resources. And that's what we're gonna talk about here today. So with FlashStack, we of course have a large variety of acquisition options for you. We call it modern acquisition, um, just like you have a modern infrastructure. So we work with our partners, both Cisco and our channel partners to provide a variety of options. From the pure side, we're offering pure as a storage, which is a true transparent metered drink your water, buy the glass, pay as you go pricing. At Cisco Live um, a couple of weeks ago, Cisco announced Cisco Plus, which is their same utility compute model, but for the compute and the network side. So you can imagine when we get to a flash stack, we combine those things into a single build single acquired utility compute model for your entire architecture. And of course, regardless of whether you buy it on a traditional capital expenditure fashion for flash deck, you buy it under a lease, you buy it as a service, we still support all of the traditional use cases or Cisco validated designs as we like to call them. A Little bit of a build slide there. I wanna say, uh, Andrew talked a lot about the flexibility and how you can move from on-prem 
to a cloud, to a hybrid cloud environment very easily with FlashStack. FlashStack uh, with a flexible consumption model is no difference on the economic side. You can consume it as a service on-prem, you can go to a public cloud, or you can go to uh, any combination in between, your own private hybrid cloud environment, for example. And we still give you the same utility compute as a service experience. Eugene talked about the importance of monitoring your infrastructure and having a single screen visibility of everything that's going on at all the layers of your infrastructure. But we believe the same is true for your economics and your usage of FlashDAC. And so when you get FlashDAC in a flexible consumption model with Cisco and Pure, you get a consolidated monitor that gives you real-time visibility into the consumption that you've used so far of all of the aspects of your stack, compute, network, and storage. And then it alerts you when you reach certain thresholds and it's time perhaps to re-up more consumption capability, more consumption capacity. The whole idea is there should never be any surprises. You should always know exactly where you are and be assured in real time that you're not paying for more resources than you need to consume at any given time. But you're also free to expand those resources dramatically in peak IT usage periods. Just like on the technology side where we support FlashDAC with a full suite of services from Cisco and Pure and our channel partners, we're doing the same thing on the economic side of FlashDAC. So we have services for onboarding you, for teaching your users uh, how to use and leverage the monitoring capabilities. We have services to deliver periodic reporting. Um, we will do internal QBRs with the account team, with our partners. And of course, we have services for ad hoc questions and inquiries into billing and use cases and escalations. Finally, I want to talk about what are some of the key attributes here? What are the benefits and why would you go to a flexible consumption model? Most companies are investigating, as I talked at the beginning of the session, beginning of my part of the session at least, most companies are going to increasingly an OPEX model. They want to pay for IT as you use IT. Makes sense. We all do that at our, in our own homes and in our own private lives. Why should business be any different? But you need to be able to support that burst demand. And that's one of the great um, benefits, economic benefits of flexible consumption. We can scale that capability and that capacity as much as you need it when you need it, as Andrew talked about. But with flexible consumption, you only pay for that amount of usage. Likewise, the most uh, common impact we see on our customers IT infrastructure is dramatic growth. Now, I come Andrew joked about me coming from the applications world and how all my examples are applications based. Um, but I mean that's the world most of your users live in. And I like to say applications never sleep. Your footprint's always growing. One of the biggest growth drivers, for example, is not even internal, it's acquisitions and mergers, MA activity. Um, and flexible consumption is an ideal way to deal with that uncertainty. Uh, how do I know which capacity I'm going to need if my growth is sporadic but constant? It's not a problem anymore. Next is your SLAs, your time to deliver. I um, mean, most IT administrators' biggest bane is SLAs with their end users, their internal end users. There's, of course, compliance issues and so forth, but your day-to-day -day pain points are often, am I able to deliver what my end users need when they need it? Again, flexible consumption eliminates all that uncertainty and all that doubt and allows you to never miss another SLA. Finally, there's this whole discussion about the benefits, economic benefits of a private cloud environment. There is always going to be stuff, data, that is too sensitive to put outside your four walls. In the application space, for example, this is always often your sensitive financial information, your sensitive customer data. 
but you still want to be able to deal with that the same way you deal with economics in a hybrid cloud environment. Flexible consumption allows you to do that, allows you to keep that data safely on-prem, but still get all the benefits of ad hoc growth without paying for more than you need. So let me talk uh, for a second on what you've heard today. We started out talking about what differentiates FlashStack from a technology standpoint. The fact that it is a stateless architecture and that stateless architecture means you can scale and grow any piece of your architecture independently as needed. Need more compute, add some nodes. Need more storage, add more flash arrays without changing the rest of your configuration. And by the way, scale that from on-prem into the cloud. Then we learned about how you manage that. Eugene talked about the importance of a single holistic view of your data and of your IT infrastructure, even down to the workload application level. These are what we call modern data infrastructure considerations. But the economics, as I said, has not kept up. So finally, Cisco and Pure are talking to customers and delivering flexible consumption models that give you a modern way to consume IT, a way that ensures you have the most efficiency possible and you dramatically lower your total cost of ownership to a place where you never pay for more than you need, but you always have what you want when you need it. With that, I wanna put in a shameless commercial plug for yet another webinar in this post COVID era. Uh, we are having an exciting uh, celebrity webinar coming up with Frank Abigail Jr. He was the subject of the movie, Catch Me If You Can. And he is perhaps the most notorious con artist of our era. Um, this looks to be a very exciting session, a very provocative speaker. And if you take your cameras out, I'll give you a second here, and you uh, hone in on the QR code at the right of the screen, you can go and uh, click right onto your registration information. So I'm going to pause for about 30 seconds and give you guys a chance to capture that. I think this is where we make some jokes, make some random comments. Did you get your camera out? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm doing shadow puppets. You just can't see them. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole blur background. That's it. It cuts that out. Or, or probably, I'm betting if folks, uh, for some reason, you can't get your camera out quickly enough. If, uh, if you Google on pure yeah. storage, catch modern data if you can, power of Google, yeah. or your preferred search browser, search engine. And you want to attend because we have some very cool GoPro giveaways. What do you know? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to our uh, host today, Andrew, who's going to um, take us through a couple of Q and A's. I guess that's uh, I guess that's kind of me by you, virtue of uh, I go first and I can I can talk all right some some of the days you know kind of thing. Uh, hopefully you're still saying we'll just leave it here on the uh, on the flash stack wrap up slide for just a second. Thank you so much for joining us today. Did have a couple questions. I'm going to just kind of play referee here and volley them around a little bit if that's all right, Eugene. Brian, Absolutely. So. Yeah, uh, not taking it unawares, but hey, that's what we're here for. So I think I will start off with a intersight type question. Um, I think Eugene, that's you, but I'm betting Brian and I might comment too. You know, because we all work together. Uh, question is paraphrasing a little bit. Um, does it only does intersight only work with pure? Or are there even things there that you know you're kind of stuck stuck with pure? I'm I'm now reading into the question a little bit, but do you kind of mind expanding on? Hey, does intersight only work with pure? Maybe some other stuff over to you yeah absolutely yeah so that's a great question I, I hear this question a lot it's it's about vendor lock-in right um and so the great thing about intersight is that intersight shares a lot of the same uh, principles that that uh, that pure does right and that principle is api first it's about programmability so uh, so so intersight has a full rest api and 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 mm -hmm. Uh, and if you think of it, it's it's really like an API concentrator where I can send commands to orchestration workflows that can kick off orchestration workflows on on Pure and so forth. And so 
The, the second thing is besides the programmability, let's say you don't want to build it all yourself, right? You don't want to use REST API calls. You want something built in. Uh, Intersight has this plugin uh, methodology. And so an example of that is that there's already plugins for ServiceNow. So for customers who have a lot of ServiceNow and you want to be able to track your assets and, and have that, that data flow to ServiceNow, those plugins are already available. And you'll see a lot more to come because of this plugin and API first methodology. So look for many, many more. So the answer is yes, there's many, many, many other capabilities <laughs> outside of Pure, uh, and you're, it's just going to get better over time. What I, what I think about there sometimes is there's a tagline that I'll use of, am I investing in a product or in a platform? Mm. And one of the things that makes something a platform, it's not just a buzzword, but a platform is, can I integrate it with anything, even potentially the stuff that I don't know about yet? Um, that's where, so some of it's, you're, you're mentioning pre-built integrations. That's the stuff I know about today. Hopefully a lot of that's there. The stuff I don't know about tomorrow, that's where an API first mindset really, really helps and makes a big difference. The example is Pure is our first Terraform provider was actually written by a customer. That's not a fail. That's a good story. They didn't have to wait for us in the early days of Terraform, you know, that kind of thing. So anything you want to add there, Brian? Well, I was going to say, you know, uh, we often overlook the topic that Eugene covered really nicely on Intersight and uh, and uh, UCS in general, which is the service profiles. And you touched on that as well. And what a great way to deal with massive consolidations of your data center. And especially, as I mentioned earlier, from mergers and acquisitions, those service pro pro profiles allow you to establish a standard configuration that you know how to run and support and monitor. And it eliminates a lot of the confusion and speeds up the time for integration of these brand new burst environments, regardless of what causes them. Awesome. This is where even uh, you mentioned, I mean, your, your t the title slide had you listed as marketing manager, Brian, but you've been doing this long enough. It's like you're going way beyond some of the marketing stuff, which is awesome. I love it. Yeah. I but I was in tech marketing before I was down in this role up here, so, you know. You know, as they say in Texas, even a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to top that analogy. So I'll go to the next question. Um, this, I'm going to toss this one over to you, Brian, if that's all right. So it's a, sure. it's a timing question. Uh, when can I buy a uh, flash stack in a, in a service construct? I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but it's really about a, I want services, service model. I want flash stack. When? Well, it's no secret what's coming. We actually uh, did a press release with uh, Cisco back in November pre-announcing this uh, flash deck as a service type concept. So we have our largest channel partners in the world already trained up and enabled to build these things. And we are today building them for customers in the channel. And so uh, check with your pure representative. We have uh, flash deck uh, experts out in the field who know how to bring in the partner and build these as a service models for you. And um, then look for some announcements later in the summer about some of the things that we talked about with regard to transparency and automation and upgrades. Now applying that to the economics of this as well. So phase one is here today and we can deliver this through our channel partners and are already doing so. Phase two, we're gonna make it even easier. So stay tuned. Cool. Mm -hmm. I think with that, I will go. There's one last question. I was actually sorting these a little bit, trying to be a good host. I put myself last, you know, or maybe I just needed time to think of an answer. I, I don't know, right? So the, the, the question was I'm um, asking could, could I come, can you comment on upgrade without re architecting and what does this mean again? I'm, I'm going to maybe presume it's sometimes where I, I join a webinar partway through and you hear something that's like, hey, hey, what? So, so when we walked through that a little bit, as you recall, there's a, a general commentary on what it means is it means that you are not held back by your technology from responding to the business. That's the business impact meaning. How do we do that? We do that through shared statelessness, core principle, UCS and pure, and the ability to upgrade without taking downtime or performance impact. That changes it from a discussion about, mm, I need to take change control windows. Maybe we're still careful about it if we're in the data center touching cables. Okay, I get that, right? But not that there's an automatic, this application has to go down. And in some cases, when, when we talk about that, you know, upgrade without re-architecting, that now we can go over, say, 10 years and not have to spend the time figuring out what's the new architecture in my data center if it's flexible enough and I can improve it 
without taking application or or business impact to it. So there's a there's a lot of pieces to unpack in that. It's why it's one of my favorite kind of uh, conceptual frameworks around Flash Stack because it hits business, it hits technical, it hits applications. I'll try not to beat that one to death. Uh, Brian or Eugene, please, if you want to add anything in there. You are muted out, Brian, I think. There we go. That's great. <laughs> it doesn't have it if I was. There you go. Uh, my favorite uh, mistake on uh, WebEx meetings. Well, you know, I find it interesting that um, how far we have come in this flash stack journey with Cisco. You know, we were the first all flash storage to create a stacked architecture, converged infrastructure architecture with Cisco. And our claim to fame was outright speed at that time. Shoot, we're fast, nobody can touch us. Mm -hmm. We're still fast, still nobody can touch us. <laughs> and yet when I listen to uh, our two uh, technical presenters who started out uh, this session, that is no longer the biggest differentiator of Flash Deck, or uh, it's certainly still a benefit, but we do so many cool additional things around scalability and management of the infrastructure that performance is just a nice, oh yeah, we have that too, thing to say. And I find that really uh, exciting. It speaks to the innovation peers brought to the table in the past five years on this platform with Cisco. Love it. Eugene, any thoughts on that or even final words before I, uh, before I bring us home? I guess the, the, the final thing I would say is that it's uh, flashback is really a journey. And I think it's taken a lot of, it's taken time for, for other companies to, to, to realize that our vision is about building the future for our customers, not just a solution for now. This isn't a, this isn't a, a rip and replace every three years. And so, and really when, when you look, when you look at a journey for a customer and, and really uh, helping customers build the future. It's about looking at forward thinking capabilities, things like NVMe over fabric and and all the things we continue to add. And so when I always challenge uh, customers and prospects, always look at what the competition is offering you and how does that address the future? And does it does it give you nearly as much as, as uh, Flashback does when it comes to uh, really understanding the market and delivering on those capabilities time and time again? So uh, thanks for the opportunity. I love it. So I think that... I feel like that even brings us back around to the, the very first slide that I had up, you know, on-prem, question mark, cloud, question mark, yes. You know, there's a, there's a great quote around comfort and performance, like you alluded to, Brian, stay for the simplicity. Mm -hmm. And if anything, when we talk about, you know, upgrading without re-architecting, that's even a cloud concept, right? We never think about that in the cloud, like you would never even do that. So you take a lot of those themes, you wrap them together. That's why, hopefully you can feel it. We enjoy talking about this topic. Thank you so much for joining us. We greatly appreciate Actual Tech hosting us as always. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Andrew, Brian, and Eugene. That was a great presentation. Uh, now the, all that's left is to announce the winner of the $300 Amazon gift card. And the winner is Angie Wolf from North Dakota. Congratulations, Angie. We'll, uh, we'll reach out to you after the event via email. Thanks again, everyone, for joining, and we hope to see you uh, on the next event. Have a great day. Goodbye.